video has been brought to you in part by Crunchyroll.com. If you'd like a completely free 30-day trial of unlimited anime streaming of over 15,000 episodes from hundreds of shows with them being updated one hour after airing in Japan on tablets, PCs, and even a load of consoles, then please head to the first line of the description or type in Crunchyroll.com forward slash caddy into your browser to get it right now. Thank you so much and please enjoy the video. <sighs> oh my god. I'm like the Micro Machines guy. Shame he doesn't have an anime. Oh my knee! Greetings and salutations my beautiful people and welcome back to part 2 of the Uncharted Canis Retrospectives! Where we are now at part 2 with Uncharted 2 Among Thieves. <laughs> what else do you want me to say? How are you performing monkey? <laughs> well I could say that Uncharted 1 came out and things happened. Nathan Drake became PS3's newest action adventure star for a new generation. From a 9.1 out of 10 with IGN to a 36 out of 40 with Famitsu, not to mention many other rewards and accolades from IGN including 2007's best action game, PS3 game of the year, best graphics technology and best original score, it's safe to say that the world fell in love with Nate Drake. Howdy. Yeah? Nate Drake. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you'd laugh more than that, honestly. Oh. And I think the lowest score I could find for the game at the time was an 8 out of 10 from GameSpot. Oh, and it got its own PlayStation Home social space. That's when you know you've hit the big time. So yeah, it went down unbelievably well in the eyes of critics and gamers alike, and where I don't fully agree with the insane praise myself, it luckily didn't deter Naughty Dog from upping their game for a sequel. In fact, the next Jack and Daxter was put on hold for full focus on Uncharted 2 because of how well everything went with the first. I remember finishing Uncharted 1 before I even heard about Uncharted 2, so I completely missed the first teaser trailer for it. But I did catch the second teaser trailer on December 15th, 2008, and it blew me away. That trailer gave me shivers and made me excited for Uncharted 2 on a level that Uncharted 1 dreamed it could reach for me. It was clear from the mystery, sudden realisation, tension, utter scale and short but sweet Nate scripting against the situation, and the way that Nate genuinely looked screwed as I wondered how the hell he'd get out of this, that Naughty Dog meant fucking business with this trailer. And it's one of my favourites ever made. A literal cliffhanger. <laughs> and one that worked wonders for my 14 year old mind. Add all of those things together after the second teaser trailer and consider me sold, which was a really Really good thing because from the second teaser trailer the release date of the game was October 13th 2009 and three days later than that for Europe and that was some of the longest 10 months I've ever had to wait for. But when the game came out, oh my god, I fell in love. The game was longer, funnier, prettier, tighter to play, tighter in the writing department, and it was everything I was expecting and more. I was literally blown away. I was also blown away by the quality of the writing within the story. Oh, that was a smooth segue. The story this time around starts off with the trailer, so yes, incredible opening for sure, where we see Nathan Drake wake up dangling from a train not knowing what's going on. And then after he somehow gets out of that by not being able to walk properly because of an abdomen wound, but yet still somehow jumping like a grasshopper in between fucking climbing and avoiding more than one nasty death, he comes across a mystical dagger stuck in the snow, leading the audience into a flash. To when an old close friend of his, Harry Flynn, and old girlfriend Chloe Fraser approached him with a job from a certain client for a large sum of money to steal a lamp from a museum. Riveting. But it's more interesting than that, since Nate figures out that within the lamps lies a map to Borneo, where Marco Polo's legendary lost fleet may be located, as well as a clue to the whereabouts of the mythical city of Shambhala, where they were carrying the massive, and again, legendary, Chintamani stone. Harry helps him out, but then realises, Oh yes, I'm a British person in an Americanised action flick, I'd better be evil now. And double crosses Drake to keep all the money to himself, and help his client secure the treasure he paid him to find. Leading to Nate getting locked in a Turkish prison for three months, only to be saved by Victor Goddamn Sullivan. with the help from Chloe. After clearing up that she had nothing to do with the double crossing and figuring out who the mysterious client of Harry's is, a Serbian war criminal known as Zoran Lazarevich, the team head off to find him and the treasure before him and Harry do, leading to more clue searching all over the world, an encounter with familiar face Alina Fisher and her cameraman Jeff, best character, also looking for Lazarevich, and many other twists and turns I won't dare say right now. This story is miles more action packed and kinetic than the first game with more surprises and more interesting developments with incredible set pieces. Not to mention with some of the best writing in the series, all supported by the great and memorable characters. Lazarevich, for instance, was a fantastic villain and the only one this game needed against the multiple terrible ones from before. He was ruthless, intimidating, completely insane, and an utter bastard who obviously hires some of the worst soldiers that can barely kill one man as a group of 20, of course. The old returning cast were great to see and the new additions were just as entertaining, with a bit more depth thrown into them this time around. Nate in this game was a lot less cocky and the game focused a lot on showing his happy-go-lucky and overly trustworthy nature as character flaws and how what everyone expects from him is too much and the consequences of being viewed 
viewed as such. Alina was more determined and independent without jumping all over the place in unrealism. She felt more human here. Harry was just the perfect ass wipe that seems pleasant at the start, yet really gets bad once his true colors show. Chloe was feisty and smart, doubling against each opposing team to keep herself alive and help the gang out whenever they were at their lowest. Sully was basically the same, a horny old trollop. And Jeff, whoa, don't get me started on him. He's Alina's cameraman for the documentary who has like two lines, gets shot, gets carried, and then dies. Good old Jeff. Best character. It was also nice to see how the story had a lot more fun with itself this time around than in the first game. Like, whenever a massively stereotyped moment should happen, like, oh, they're looking for a temple, and then without even looking for five minutes, they seem to find it through a pair of binoculars. The characters within the game, instead of just accepting it as it is, they would make a comment about how funny or weird or coincidental it is, and it made the game feel a lot more special in that regard compared to the first game, and how it was very much full of stereotypes. In the presentation, well, the music was the same kind of stuff, which was great. Voice acting was just as fantastic, but with much more confident and witty writing, not to mention more confident and witty delivery, with moments that actually made me laugh, rare in an action-adventure game such as this. There's a guy above you, there's a guy above you. There's a guy below you, there's a guy below you. I'm sweating like a hooker in church. You brought a hooker to church? Why not? Yeah, good luck, pal. I mean, that's almost impossible to- oh, you did it. Nice. Stalin. Paul Pot, they were all great men. But do you know why they prevailed? I'm sure you're gonna tell us. Dear God. Oh, no, it's not that bad. Look, I have my own bucket. On a scale of one to ten, how scared were you that I was gonna die? Four. Four? Yeah, why? A four. four. Yeah. You were at least an eight. An eight? You were a total eight. What's a ten? Clowns? Clowns over my death? I... I hate clowns. clowns. I hate clowns. Visually as well, my god, it blew the first game out of the water. It had the same art style and rendering look to it, but it was brimming with more detail, even giving some games nowadays a huge run for their money. This time it was more than just a brief adventure on an island with a few jungles and temples. I mean, yeah, they were still here and much better looking, but this time it's a worldwide expedition through many different and varied areas and locales, ranging from Turkey, Borneo, Nepal, Tibet, and the Himalayas. All encompassing beautifully contrasted environmental design like concrete urban war zones, serene city Cityscapes, dense and piercing snowy mountaintops, and the classic jungles and temples seen previously. The scale this time around was so much grander and unbelievably impressive, and there were more huge areas with huge wide camera angles to show it all off, with each succeeding iteration of a big area getting more impressive and beautiful each time. Little known fact, when you open the doors to Shambhala and see that, and then realize you can explore it, that was the first time I said wow to myself in a video game, with nobody around to see me say it. Looking like a dingbat. The cherry on the cake was the refined animation and facial work, being more believable and better executed overall, especially noticeable whenever Nate's standing on a crumbling thing. And yes, they still kept in the human details like Nate's I thought I turned on the hot tap but instead it was a coal tap face whenever he was under fire. Fun fact. Did you know that in chapter 5 there are oodles of references to Naughty Dog scattered throughout the urban war zone? For instance, there are billboards that read Club Raja and Hotel El Dorado, referencing the first game, and there are several movie posters around the level for fake movies starring Naughty Dog employees. Oh, those dirty nogs. The way the game played, though, was another story, because Naughty Dog had already got a decent foundation for the gameplay, so all they had to do was improve upon it. And they did. The gameplay was kind of the same thing from the first, but refined perfectly. I mean, it must have been pretty close to the original, since the train segment in the final game was actually planned DLC for the first game. Thank God it wasn't for the entire structure of the story's sake, and, you know, ethics and shit. The more awkward things from the first, like the jet ski scenes, were taken out for focus to be left on everything else, despite the shooting, enemy variety, driving turret sections, and the control style being practically the same. No, 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 no. What was most notably different was the platforming. Co-lead designer Richard Lamartian stated that Uncharted 2 would feature a more realistic climbing system, and with improved animations and tech, Drake could climb and explore easier and in a more free-formed manner, and that indeed was not a bluff. Platforming felt so much more bouncy and less restrictive, with more intricately executed and varied platforming segments, from chases to better rope swinging and better climbing, everything was better and more exciting, and there were more moments designed in such a way to make you feel like you could just make all the jumps, and just make that climb. It truly felt more treacherous in that regard, and even some scenes in the game would bring you inches away from death to evoke the same feeling, to then 
then save you at the last second. Melee combat was also tweaked with a more hectic and fast paced button mash countering system to help make CQC easier while being gunned down, and instead of the slightly stiff brutal combo system to give you weapon bonuses, instead this game improved the stealth attacks to make them more of a core feature and then made them give you the bonuses. And they worked wonders this time as opposed to the fucking bat ear AI of the last games by having Nate crouch down and lock onto enemies better without being at a pixel perfect distance like in the first game. Quick time events were also gone entirely, minus one or two bits when you had to fight enemies twice the size of you and then they grabbed you and pinned you to the floor, but the commands there were always the same so it never felt intrusive and they were always a punishment for getting too close to the strong enemy. And that is what I call a strong enemy. <laughs> Fun fact. Did you know that the original title for Chapter 14 was Drakes on a Train, being a reference to the movie Snakes on a Plane? However, it's unknown whether or not copyright issues were the reason it got changed. I personally think so, even though it sounds nothing like its original reference. <laughs> Also, despite not being a heavily explorative-centered game, again like the first, this time around, due to the utter giant scale of the set pieces, it somehow made you feel like you discovered them from your own intuition. Yes, from a linear game. Much like how I'd feel when coming across a tomb in Tomb Raider, or when I came across an abandoned landmark in Ethan Carter. And how it does that in a linear game is unbelievable. Although since the presentation had had a huge increase in quality, it would have been a shame to not include more elements to the exploration, so yes, the treasure hunting came back, but it was bigger, better, more imaginative and tricky. There were about 100 treasures this time around as opposed to about 60 in the last, and they all worked in tangent with the incredible visual detail to make sure that you searched through and saw every beautiful inch of the detail the devs put into making the game. And of course, it helped contribute to the rewards, which were back with a vengeance, and not only featured the same unlimited ammo and even invincibility, but featured skins of characters from the original game, this game, as well as... Well, that thing. Oh, and the puzzles returned, and even though not a massive aspect, they were more fun to solve and more difficult since you had Nate's journal to look through instead of a convenient diary that had the answers right there in front of you and you couldn't change the pages on. And you had to actually look through the pages to find the correct clues and sort out what they mean more or less on your own whenever the game prompted you to look at the journal. Also, seeing Nate's doodles was always pretty funny to me. I love these pictures here. How about the boss encounters, though? Was there any improvement there? Well, to be honest, much like the first game, the second wasn't really too focused on boss encounters unless you count the um, monstrously scary tank battle or the couple of helicopter encounters, but I would have called them more action set pieces than solid boss battles. But the final battle, as opposed to Uncharted 1, which was fucking terrible, the final boss in Uncharted 2 against Lazarevich himself, that shit was a great finale and bloody hard to boot. When entering Shambhala, the game pulls all the punches it can. I played the game on hard mode when getting this footage and holy shit, this entire last stretch of the game was just cruel with how hard it was. Fuck trying this on brutal or crushing mode. Not only are there sections with huge swarms of soldiers, but oftentimes without checkpoints. And you also have to fight the guardians who lived off of the sap from the tree of life, making them near invincible, super fast, and with the most powerful weapons in the game. Oh, and how about both of them at the same time? <laughs> Oh lord, if you've played this, you know what I mean, it's hard. And when meeting Lazarevich as he drinks the same sap, you have to run around a small enclosed jungle area with explosive resin everywhere, a seriously pissed off character running after you with a two shot on your dead shotgun, at least on hard mode, and having to lure him into each explosive resin lump and blast him about 12 times to beat him. Oh, and after six times, he throws grenades at you, oh joy. Yes, the improved platforming control makes this intense run and gun a little more forgiving, but damn, it's still hard. It's an endurance test, a test of wit, learning patterns, figuring paths, being careful around the resin, and dodging shots. It's not too bad on easy or normal, but on hard it's a bastard of a boss, and some would argue maybe too hard compared to the rest of the game. It's a weird difficulty spike, but damn, it feels so good to end his crusade. Like I said though, if you play on harder difficulties though, be prepared to hear these same lines a lot. You think you can stop me? You will not stand in the way of destiny! As far as any issues with this game go, I honestly don't have any. This is one of the finest third person, running, gunning, action adventure, treasure hunting spectacles of a game I have ever played through. And even just looking at it as a spectacle, as a blockbuster game in itself, it's perfect for what it sets out to do. It's one of the best sequels I've ever played and one of the more confident ones as well, without being cocky and without biting off more than it can chew. And so the final question remains. Does Uncharted 2 Among Thieves hold up today? Do I even need to answer that? Do I?
Honestly, if I could say skip the first and start with this one, I really would, but just to see the jumping quality and to get invested with the lore and the characters alone, playing one first is definitely required to make sure you realise how much better Uncharted 2 is as a sequel and a general game. In the end though, after bringing Alina along for the ride to Shambhala, Chloe getting captured by Lazarevich on a train, a train ride, a train battle, a train crash, a train train, and a train train, Nate gets saved by a village in Tibet after sustaining too much damage. We all then find out that the golden dagger picked up earlier and seen in the intro is the key to Shambhala, where the fable Chintamani stone resides. Weird yeti creatures attack, it's very scary. Village gets attacked, it's very sad. Then they get caught by Lazarevich and Harry and get forced to open Shambhala before death. And after many fun thrilled frolics like this, <laughs> we find out that the Chintamani stone is actually giant amber inside of a prehistoric tree of life within Shambhala. And the yeti things were actually guardians stopping any idiot explorers from drinking the sap from the tree of life and turning, like I mentioned earlier, near invincible, which Lazarevich does indeed do. And in a climatic battle, the tree starts dying, the city crumbles, Oh dear. And everyone makes it out okay, ready to rest. <laughs> yeah, right, let's go on another adventure. <laughs> and what better time to do that, honestly? With money pouring in, everyone talking about it, and eyes all on Naughty Dog for their next big project, the question is, could they go even further? Or would they just be doing a sequel for the sake of it and pander to critical response? Or would they just do another game? By another instalment? That, that doesn't make any sense. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching part 2 of this Uncharted Trilogy video series. Part 3 will be done very shortly and I will link it- <coughs> sorry, I'll- whoops. I'll link it at the end of this video on the right hand side. Um, if you want something a little bit different, um, because that video will take two weeks to finish instead of one week, um, you'll see the other videos I'm working on because it's taking me so long to get these videos done. Um, and that'll be in the middle, Fallout Easter Egg Hunting Part 1. So you can click on that to go straight to there. And also, I'll just put a random video on the left I haven't decided yet. If it's your birthday day watching this video, happy freaking birthday to you, and please remember to stay beautiful. This story is miles more kinetic and action-packed than the first game, and... And so, the final question remains. <laughs> Fun fact. Did you know that I'm recording this video with no pair of jeans on? Like, you, you can't see under here, so you don't know what I'm wearing.